All right, so I'll go ahead and um, get started here. So today I'll be talking to you a bit about my lab's work at looking at positive and negative selection across genomes. So by, by way of introduction, the uh, studies of genetic variation are now uh, becoming possible in, in many different uh, species, and a lot of data is being collected. And so what, what I'm showing on this slide here is a number of different species. And the average pairwise uh, uh, differences per site between two different sequences taken from those species. So in other words, um, if you take, for example, the, the cheetah here, and you look and see, like, a, a, take two chromosomes from there and just look at how different are those two chromosomes, you'll see that on average should be have 0.02% um, uh, per, uh, uh, of the sites would differ. And you can see there's tremendous variation in diversity from 0.02% all the way up to 1.5%. Um, and one of the major questions in population genetics is why does the, the amount of genetic diversity vary so dramatically across species? And um, I just want to point out, so our species, uh, at least putatively our species of, of humans, has around a 0.1% uh, genetic diversity. And you can even see that among different species of orange, there's uh, more than an order of magnitude uh, variation in uh, diversity. So we want to understand why, why that's the case. One possibility is... In general, no, actually. Um, this uh, particular type of oranges has really high diversity, but typically plants fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, insects and uh, marine uh, invertebrates uh, typically also have uh, fairly high diversity. That's one of the uh, uh, common trends. So one possibility is that natural selection could differ across these, these different species, and so that's what I'll be talking about here today. Just so by way of quick introduction, there's a couple types of natural selection that we'll be very concerned about. The first is positive selection. This is the case where a new mutation arises that results in an increase in uh, fitness in individuals that carry that particular mutation. And so typically, if these mutations become established in the population, they'll go on an increase in frequency because the people who have them are tending to reproduce at a faster rate. And there's tremendous interest in studying these and understanding them because they yield cool stories about how organisms are adapting to their environment uh, and that sort of thing. A second type of selection is what's called negative natural selection. And this is essentially the opposite process, whereby deleterious mutations, or those mutations that result in a decrease in fitness, get removed from the population because the individuals carrying them tend to have fewer kids than those who, who do not. And so you can see the trajectory of one of those mutations would go, go, um, go down. So there's been tremendous interest in population genetics in, in quantifying uh, how much of these types of selection occur uh, across genomes. And one way to sort of more formally think about this is in terms of the distribution of fitness effects, or DFE. And this is a critical distribution in population genetics. So what, what is the DFE? Well, it's simply a histogram or distribution of the selection coefficients of new mutations that might occur either in the genome or in some compartment of the genome. And for my talk today, I'll be mostly talking about or probably exclusively talking about amino acid changing mutations that, that occur uh, at, at different sites. And so here's one hypothetical distribution of fitness effects where you've got many mutations that are strongly deleterious, many that are essentially neutral or have no effect on fitness, and then some in, in, in the middle, but, but not too many that are, that are sort of weakly or moderately deleterious and very few beneficial mutations. A second hypothetical distribution of fitness effects could look like this red curve, where there are many neutral mutations, as well as some nearly neutral and weakly deleterious ones, but fewer strongly deleterious ones. A third DFE could look like this, where there's maybe now also a proportion of weakly beneficial mutations. And so there's tremendous interest in figuring out what this distribution of fitness effects looks like, because it's really a key parameter for understanding why genetic variation could vary across species and really how evolution operates. So there's been an, yes? So that's the distribution you get to observe because organisms survive, or the distribution of the stuff, the hypothetical distribution of the stuff that comes in? Because ah, the good. That's strong, is it right? Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, yeah. So this distribution, and there's a lot actually like, some confusion about this in the literature even, about what exactly we're talking about. So for my talk today, and less said otherwise, we're talking about for new mutations that first arise. So not the stuff that ultimately survives to be sampled when you collect individuals. And the idea is how, what we're jumping ahead a little bit, what we're going to do is to, uh, use data from individuals sampled along with population genetic models to try and infer what this distribution looks like. And I'll get into detail about how that works uh, in the next couple minutes. 
But before we get there, there have been a number of other approaches that have been taken to study mutations, one of which are uh, mutation accumulation uh, lines. And they, there's a variety of different strategies of how one, one could do this. Um, but they all go something like this, where you basically start with some ancestral line, make different, essentially, replicate populations, allow them to accumulate mutations, and then you look at the fitness of the lines at the end. Um, these days, you can also do a lot of uh, clever sequencing approaches to actually more directly measure what happens to mutations uh, from generation to generation. Uh, but the net result of these types of experiments is that many of the lines out the other end that have accumulated mutations tend to have lower fitness than the wild type ancestral starting material. And that suggests that many spontaneous mutations that occur are deleterious. Um, you can also try to fit a model to, to the, you know, the, the distribution of fitnesses to then back infer what that distribution of fitness effects looks like. So that gives some indication of it, but there's some problems with these types of experimental evolution or mutation accumulation experiments. So the first is it's hard to actually study the, the very slight effects on fitness because that's just really hard to measure those slight changes in laboratory um, type assays. Also, there's a bit of an artificial sense to these experiments because they're occurring in the laboratory, not in natural uh, populations. That may or may not introduce some biases. Of course, probably the biggest one is we're very limited to only studying certain model organisms that are like, like yeast, uh, drosophila, bacteria certainly. Um, maybe mice in some instances can be used in this, but, but there's, you can't really study humans or other um, higher organisms in this, in this context as well. And so then that obviously leads to the question, are there other approaches to studying fitness effects of mutations? And the approach that I'm going to tell you about in my talk today is to actually address these questions in a slightly different manner by looking at genetic variation data in natural populations of a variety of different species in their natural environment, and then combine that with population genetic models and inference methods to then try to learn something about the DFE. So specifically, my, my talk has three parts. The first is more of a review and overview of methods of how you can use genetic variation data to try and learn about the distribution of fitness effects. And then I'll use that type of framework to sort of uh, address two, two other questions. Um, well, really three, but these, these two sort of go, go together. Uh, namely, what are the biological factors that determine the DFE? And how does the DFE differ across species? And lastly, I'll talk about uh, beneficial mutations and whether those uh, differ, or the patterns of those and the amount of them differ uh, across species. So to get started, I'll give you a bit of an overview of some of the ways that we could estimate the distribution of fitness effects from genetic variation data. And the approach that we're going to use starts with something called the site frequency spectrum, or SFS. And this is really crucial to everything I'll be talking about, so I'll spend a few minutes uh, uh, introducing it. But the basic idea is if we have some DNA sequence data from a natural population, uh, in this case of uh, five, essentially five haploid sequences, if you will, uh, and then you sequence a stretch of it. The polymorphic or variable sites are shown here by, by these. These are the positions in the sequence, and, and the different columns are, are denote these, these particular sites. So this is the raw, essentially the raw sequence data. And we could think about this as being for, say, either a certain kind of mutation. So we could just look at, for example, amino acid changing mutation, or amino acid <laughs> variants, or maybe synonymous variants were those that don't change the amino acid. And we might look at those separately. And I'll, I'll say a few more words about that um, in a few minutes. But basically, the way this works is, is we have all of these different sites here. And this is the site frequency spectrum, or SFS. And essentially what we do is we can say each of these SNPs, or each of these uh, variable columns here, has some, the derived or the mutant allele has some particular frequency in the population. So for example, this first site here, 163, you see that the ancestral allele was the uh, A nucleotide, and there was a mutation that gave rise to the uh, G uh, nucleotide right here. And so the, the idea is the, um, this uh, G nucleotide here, the derived allele, is seen at frequency 1 out of 5. And that's what's denoted down here. And the second site, right, the T nucleotides at frequency 2 out of 5. The third site, the A, is at 3 out of 5, and so on and so forth. So each of these sites has a particular frequency. And then basically what the site frequency spectrum does is it simply summarizes this. So it basically says there are five variable sites in the data where the derived or mutant allele is at frequency 1 out of 5. So those are the five outlined in these blue boxes. This one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Those five together end up in this column. There are two sites at frequency 2 out of 5. 
or two sites where the derived allele has frequency two out of five, this one and this one. Whoops. Three sites where the derived allele is at, excuse me, two sites where the derived allele is at frequency three out of five, this one and this one. And no sites where the derived allele is at frequency four out of five. So the basic idea is you can tabulate this particular summary statistic from the data quite, quite easily. And why this is a useful thing to do is it turns out that this is very much affected by natural selection. So what I'm showing you here is the same site frequency spectrum for different for deleterious mutations with different strengths of selection. So here, this is a neutral site frequency spectrum. And then as you move to the right, mutations become more deleterious. And you'll notice there's two things that are happening, right? So the heights of the bars just denote the number of SNPs at that frequency. So the first thing you note is as mutations become more deleterious, you just see the heights of all the bars are decreased. So there's less genetic variation segregating, and that ought to make intuitive sense because it vari deleterious variation is being eliminated from the population by selection, so you should see less variation. That's the first thing. The second thing to note is of the variants that, that remain, they tend to be skewed towards ver low frequency variants. And again, that makes sense because you would think that deleterious alleles should be on average any one of those should be, uh, have a rarer frequency than would a given uh, neutral uh, allele. And so the idea is we can leverage this, this, this idea that, that selection affects the frequency spectrum and essentially use a frequency spectrum from data to then back infer this uh, strength of selection. Now, there's some subtleties to this, uh, the, not the least of which is that this frequency spectrum is influenced by things other than selection. Namely, population history, like whether the population went through a bottleneck or expanded or contracted or that sort of thing, can have a really profound impact on the frequency spectrum. And so the way that, that we and others uh, uh, deal with that is to actually take a class of putatively neutral sites, or sites that we believe are not under selection, and actually fit a uh, demographic model to that uh, frequency spectrum. So this could be like synonymous sites. We would use that frequency spectrum to essentially model the demographic process and then look at the class of sites that we think might be under selection, the non-synonymous or amino acid changing sites. And essentially, the difference between these frequency spectra is what's driven essentially by the effects of selection. And so then we build into the model selection that would get essentially to go from here to here, and then look at the parameters of that distribution. And I'll give you a few more details about how that works over the next few slides. But this is sort of the basic idea of, of what we're doing, where we want to use this site frequency spectrum to essentially estimate uh, the parameters of this distribution of selection coefficients. So I'll tell you a bit about some of the, the model here. So first, we're making an assumption that all sites are independent of each other. Um, and you can certainly quibble about that if you have sites that are closely linked, right? Um, they're, they're obviously not independent of each other. But it turns out that um, this is a composite likelihood framework. And composite likelihood estimators have some pretty good properties. And I'll show you some simulation results where we actually do simul simulate data with linkage. Uh, in it and then use this type of approach where we pretend their sites are independent and it actually performs pretty well. Um, so I'll explain that later. And the assumption here is right then that each entry or each bin of this frequency spectrum, uh, we're going to use xi here to essentially denote the num x would be the number of SNPs at count i in the sample. So x1 would be the number of singletons in the frequency spectrum, x2 the number of doubletons, et cetera. And the assumption is that this xi would be a, a Poisson uh, random variable. And so the basic idea is something like this. And so this is for the aficionados out there. This is what's called the Poisson random field framework, which was originally published by Sawyer and Hartle in 1992, has been extended in a number of ways over the years. And I'll tell you a bit about some of our extensions uh, on, on this uh, as, as well. But the basic idea is, is the following here, right? So if we say xi, right, again, this is the number of SNPs we expect to see in a sample of size n at um, frequency, you know, whatever i is, whether i is singletons, doubletons, and so on. And this, I'll, this <laughs> equation here has a number of different pieces to it. So this here should look probably familiar, right? This is a binomial distribution. And so the idea here is x is the population allele frequency, which of course we don't know. Um, what we observe in our data, right, will be we know n, that's our sample size, and we know i, i is the count in our sample, so we know that. Um, and so the idea is this step here, this binomial distribution accounts for uh, the binomial sampling from the population into our sample that we've actually sequenced. 
This next part here, this reflects the population allele frequencies of a particular SNP, right? So x is the uh, population allele frequency. Then we've got these other two parameters here. We're using capital theta to denote the demographic history of the population. And so that, this can be whatever arbitrary demography that your, you, your population evolved under, whether it's a bottleneck growth, what, what have you. And this gamma here represents a, uh, the selection coefficient uh, of, of a particular of a particular SNP. So the idea is this step here says, OK, we have a given demography and selection coefficient. What do we expect the population allele frequency distribution to look like? And I'll talk about how we compute this in, in a minute. And then this last part here, this uh, G of gamma here, this is our distribution of fitness effects. So again, this gamma is a particular selection coefficient. And this distribution here says, OK, for every, any one value of gamma or any one selection coefficient, what's the probability of, of having it? And this theta DFE, that's ultimately what we want to estimate. That's our, our the parameters of this distribution of fitness effects. And that typically is some type of parametric distribution. We like gamma distributions. but uh, we've also explored a variety of others from mixture distributions um, to a mixture point mass and gamma distribution, log normal distribution, that sort of thing. And generally, they give pretty similar results. Um, but the gamma works well in many contexts. And so the idea is we want to integrate over this distribution of uh, fitness effects here. And in practice, the way that we actually do this is um, we can essentially use, uh, there's a, lot, a rich theory, uh, theory, set of theory in population genetics that essentially uses the diffusion approximations to say, what do you expect allele frequencies to be in a population given a demographic history and a selection coefficient? And so we can leverage that essentially to find this, uh, this f function here. And what, what's being shown here is just this would be the frequency spectrum for a given demographic model and a given selection coefficient, or a given value of gamma. So this would be neutral. This is essentially some weakly deleterious ones. And then we get more strongly deleterious. You can see the different frequency spectra. The demographic model is fixed here. Yes. So you're not trying to make any inference. Exactly. Exactly. So what we would do is, and you may say, how would you know that? And what we would typically do is, is we would first um, fit the demographic model based on neutral sites. Uh, like synonymous sites, and then cons estimate those parameters, which would be this theta here, and then we keep that fixed at the maximum likelihood estimates to then go on and do the inference of selection. In principle, you could do both together, but computationally it gets much more intractable. And we and others have shown the approach of fixing the demographic model at the MLEs actually works reasonably well on simulated data. Yes? The, the assumption here is that they're independent of each other. Yes? Ah, OK. So the important point here is we're not actually, there's, okay, there's a couple ways to do inference with the frequency spectrum. So here we're not actually conditioning on the total number of SNPs in our data. Um, in other words, we are, um, the numbers of SNPs that you see in the data is actually a um, function of the, right, the mutation rate, the demography, and, and selection, all of that together. And so in other words, if you have a lot of singletons, that does not automatically itself place a restriction that you have to have fewer doubletons. Whereas if you said we're going to condition on there being 1,000 SNPs in our data, the observed number, and then if you say they're all singletons, then you're absolutely right. Then you would know that there uh, would be very few doubletons. That other way of doing the inference, you wouldn't use this Poisson assumption. You'd use a multinomial distribution, which would then condition on the total number uh, of, of SNPs. But you're, I would also agree that the assumption that SNPs are independent is also violated um, you know, because of linkage disequilibrium and that sort of thing. Um, and, but it turns out that it actually doesn't have as big of an impact on the inference. Um, it does in terms of getting like, confidence intervals or for likelihood ratio tests of the parameters, uh, because essentially the variance is actually larger than what the asymptotic theory would predict. But in terms of getting the point estimates, they, they, they do tend to be unbiased. And I'll show you how we can use simulations to work, work out of that, uh, that problem. <laughs>
the, oh, this data here. That's the mutation rate. Yeah, good, good point there. So that's the input of mutations into the population. And this is sort of all what happens to them once they come in due, uh, due to demography and, and selection. Uh, so, so what we then do is to actually, uh, so, so this, right, so these are, we can essentially find the frequency spectrum for uh, different values of gamma and then, or different selection coefficients, and then given our DFE that we're considering, we can essentially weight each of these by the probability of that value of selection, of, of that um, selection coefficient coming from the distribution of fitness effects. And um, the final distribution, or the final frequency spectrum is essentially this weighted uh, average of these different values. And so the idea is the, the computational advance that, that we made was essentially at the outset uh, calculate the frequency spectra, store them in lookup tables, and then go back through for evaluating different DFEs and essentially just change the weightings of these rather than you know, resolve the diffusion equation each for every parameter combination of the distribution of fitness effects. And the idea is then, OK, so we're, why are we doing this and where does it get us? We ultimately want to do is do um, a composite likelihood inference of, of our parameters. And so if given this, this Poisson random field framework that we're operating in, we can essentially use a Poisson likelihood function here, where, where x, remember, is our data. This theta is our demographic parameters. And then the theta DFE, that's what we, the parameters we're interested in, in um, uh, optimizing here and finding the MLEs for, that's the, uh, our distribution of fitness effects. And so the idea is we can use this framework here to compute essentially the, the rate parameter, if you will, in the Poisson distribution or the expected uh, number, the expected frequency spectrum as a function of the um, model parameters. And, and then we can es essentially optimize this to find the MLEs of the parameters. Correct. So have a little feed ahead there, which is a, an estimate of the mutation rate. Yeah, and it turns, it turn, right, right. And it turns out the mutation rate actually is, is important because it determines, right, so in, intuitively, if you don't see much variation there, then you could think, well, is it that there's a lot of strong selection and you've gotten rid of it, or is it that the mutation rate is, is really low? And um, both of those could, could contribute. And so our approach to that is to, you know, look at different mutation rates that have been estimated using a variety of different approaches from the literature, you know, some of the more recent pedigree-based estimates, as well as you know, see what happens if we increase the mutation rate and use the um, you know, sort of more old school phylogenetic methods. And in some cases, that makes a little bit of a difference. Yes. Could there be some other integral or some uh, to be put in this expression that would actually allow you to put a little theta t, <laughs> non-constant over the genome, and kind of normalize for non-constant underlying mutation rate? In principle, you could. So, so the way that the way that we're typically dealing with this is we're considering either the uh, class of mutations across the whole genome, like all non-synonymous sites, or as, as I'll sh show later, maybe a specific subset of genes that we're, we're thinking about. And even for that inference, we would, you could vary the, the mutation rate. Uh, I mean, you do worry a little bit if you get, start to get too many parameters uh, in, in the model. But, um, but yeah, in principle, you, you could. These types of methods typically haven't been applied to single genes uh, because you don't have enough variation there. But the thing is, as sample size grows into the thousands, you'll be having more, if, more data. If it's genome-wide, perhaps I'm making yeah. wrong. But accounting for a varying mutation rate along the genome, even for, for an inference on theta DSE that is genome-wide, may actually change the picture. So, so as long as the, the mutation rate that you're using is, is essentially the average rate, then the, the how much that varies doesn't actually matter because we're essentially treating all the sites as being independent and identically distributed. Okay. Okay. So, so we've uh, ex sort of uh, we've extended the uh, this, this this pipeline and have developed some software to be able to do this inference in a program called. I actually don't have the. Oh, well, that's poor advertising. Um, we don't have the name of it on here. Uh, <laughs> this is a program uh, called called Fit Daddy. Uh, that does this, uh, this inference. The backstory in the name is. 
put Fit Daddy up here and, and may put Bernard's picture uh, there uh, for um, developing it. But basically, this is ex extending a previously developed software called Daddy that does uh, demographic inference using the uh, diffusion uh, approximation. And so we're adding in this distribution of fitness effects components, hence the name Fit, Fit Daddy. OK, so that's kind of the approach that one could take to study, uh, use genetic variation data uh, to, to learn about uh, fitness effects in, in different populations. And so I'm going to tell you a bit about next is, is applying some of this, this, uh, the, this kind of framework to look at the biological factors that might determine the distribution of fitness effects and how this distribution differs across species. So by way of introduction uh, uh, and, and to sort of introduce the, the problem, what we want to do is think about what are factors that influence why a distribution of fitness effects looks the way, the way it might. There's actually been a lot of theory that's been developed uh, along these lines that uh, these different types of theory t typically emphasize different factors at being important for determining the DFE. And so I'll walk you through a little bit about what what that um, entails. And I think by way of doing it, we should c maybe compare and contrast two different organisms that maybe have some different attributes. And so for, by way of this introduction, I'll be talking about uh, humans and, and, uh, and flies. Um, and typically, or what the, the key point here is that we, what I'm trying to do is set up a contrast between um, species with two different properties. So one species having essentially high complexity, and I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second, and small population size, and another species having typically lower complexity and perhaps larger um, population size. Now we could obviously have a spend the rest of the time talking about what exactly biological complexity means, and it's a bit of a, a sort of a fuzzy um, concept, but um, studies, for example, of protein-protein interactions uh, typically find more in, in uh, mammals than in insects. Uh, and so here I'm, we're thinking about essentially biological complexity measured in some way, shape, or form. It's not the size of the genome. It's not, it doesn't have to be the size of the genome. Uh, maybe it's related to that, but that's not exactly what I'm, what I'm referring to here. I'll have a more precise definition of complexity in a certain context uh, in, in a few slides. So humor me for, for a few minutes to at least outline the models and then see if, if this sort of makes sense. So, Probably the simplest model uh, for what, what the distribution of fitness effects could look like in different species is that, well, it's essentially the same across species. So the idea is, what determines the distribution of fitness effects? Well, it's essentially the average over all these different genes. Mutations in some genes have no effect on fitness. Mutations in other genes could be lethal. And this distribution is essentially a you know, weighted average over all of that. And you know, generally, things are stable over time, maybe. This is sort of the thinking behind maybe the comparative genomics paradigm, where you align sequences of different species, and the exons look pretty conserved. And so you know, maybe this stuff has all you know, evolved long ago, and there's not really much different between species. And so it's really just the functional importance of proteins that, that determines this, and, and that things are generally the same. So that would, this sort of null model would predict the distribution of selection coefficients ought to be the same. A second model says actually, well, maybe it's not the function of the particular proteins that determines what's important, but maybe it actually has to do with making stable proteins, right? So making proteins incurs some cost. If they misfold, then that has other costs. And so generally, we want, just for cells, we want to have stable proteins. And it turns out, under some conditions, this model actually predicts that the distribution of NS n being the population size, s being our selection coefficient that we're interested in, that this distribution ought to be the same between different species. And the intuition behind this, this uh, uh, prediction is that, OK, in the large population size, right, by definition, n is big. Uh, and that then leads to more efficient selection for stable proteins. And so the idea is when subsequent mutations arise in those really stable proteins, they will not really disrupt something important because you have a really stable protein, so you don't break it. So the idea is S, or the selection coefficient for subsequent deleterious mutations, ought to be fairly small. Whereas in the uh, other case, in the small population size, N is smaller, but then the, uh, the proteins are not as tolerant to new mutations, and so then subsequent mutations will incur uh, you know, will result in more misfolding, incurring a fitness cost, yielding a larger value of S. So this is essentially a model of with some kind of epistasis uh, in it. 
A third prediction is what I'm calling the mutational robustness models. And what these models, complexity is the key idea here. And the idea is in the more complex species, you have more redundancy in pathways, more mechanisms to buffer out the effects of deleterious mutations. And so now in this population, the average mutation ought to be less deleterious than in the simpler um, uh, uh, species. The last category or last model that I'll be talking about is Fisher's geometric model. And I'll say a few more words about what that is and how that model works in a, in a few minutes. But essentially, this model makes the opposite prediction. The, the basic idea here is that in the um, more complex species, you, a mutation is more likely to disrupt something important or break something important that will have a fitness effect. And so then, on average, mutations will be more deleterious in the more complex species. Fisher's geometric model also makes some predictions about the amount of positive selection in different uh, uh, species. And I'll say a few more words about that uh, in, in a few minutes. So importantly, all of these models have some sort of support from some experimental system or, or study. But what, they haven't been, uh, what hasn't been done is comparing and contrasting which of these models can actually explain differences in distributions of fitness effects across different species. In other words, which model can sort of capture the key, or can any of the models really capture any of these uh, key salient features that we see when looking at genetic variation data from natural populations? And so that's what we did. This is the work of uh, Christian Huber in my lab, where basically the, the, the key idea is that these models make di distinct predictions about how this distribution of fitness effects should vary across species. And so what we did was actually look at differences in distributions of fitness effects across species, focusing on polymorphism data from natural populations, leveraging the theory and statistical methods that I outlined um, at the beginning of, of the talk. And so specifically for the aficionados, right, we looked at for, we compared the distribution of fitness effects for amino acid changing mutations in humans using the uh, Yoruba 1000 genomes data. And initially starting out comparing to Drosophila using a uh, population from, uh, from Zambia. Uh, about 100 individuals studied per, per population. Uh, and so what we did was we used this, this approach that I outlined before where we first estimate the demographic history of each population and then conditional on those demographic parameter estimates infer the distribution of fitness effects. And I want to say one other thing, because right, humans and flies have very different effective population sizes, different amounts of genetic diversity, different demographies. One of the neat features about this approach is that we can essentially, we estimate the demography separately in each species, and each species can have its own uh, demographic model. So the idea is we're accounting for the fact that flies have a much larger population size than do humans and have different demographies. That's being built into the inference. So the results I'll be telling you about are uh, robust to those differences in population size. But, but the sample sizes are about 100, in the, yeah. 100 humans and about 100 flies. Okay. That's right. Yeah, we picked them to be, to be the same. So what I'm showing you here is the, so this is when we first fit a gamma distribution uh, for the distribution of fitness effects. What I'm showing you here is this is a likelihood surface for the uh, shape and uh, scale parameter of the uh, gamma distribution. This is for, for obviously for humans. Here are our maximum likelihood uh, parameter estimates and, and the log likelihood. When we play this game for Drosophila, we, uh, the uh, maximum likelihood estimate uh, or parameter estimates are up here. And you can see that the parameter estimates differ. And then what we did was we fit a constrained model where we essentially allowed, said, OK, what's the shape and scale parameter, uh, forcing it to be the same between both species? What would that look like? And um, Here's the, the constrained or the restricted model. We would have these parameter estimates or the one shown here in the, by the, the gray dot. And what I'm showing you here, again, the log likelihoods for the, um, you know, the, the essentially the full model. Uh, we have the log likelihood here. And then the restricted or constrained model has uh, almost an order of magnitude worse uh, log likelihood. And so by a you know, straightforward likelihood ratio test, the full model fits the data significantly better than does the restricted model. And you might ask, well, why, why is that the case? Or what, what's actually different? Why, how do the DFEs differ between the, popula or between the species? And so this here is showing from our best fitting models the distribution of selection coefficients in blue for humans, red for flies, and the gray is the, essentially the combined uh, parameter estimates. And what we find is that in humans, we have a much higher proportion of strongly deleterious mutations than what we see uh, in, in uh, Drosophila. Now, you might say, well, you know, this p-value, that's great. That's small. It's impressive. But you know, I just said that the asymptotics of likelihood ratio tests don't, don't apply here. 
And so what we did was we did a, a, a large number of, of simulations where we simulate data under the demographies of the two different species. Uh, in this case here, where we have the distribution of fitness effects constrained to be the same, or where it is the same in both species, and then in this plot here, where we use the uh, best fitting parameter estimates for each of the different species, we simulate a bunch of data sets with linkage, and then employ the inference method where we, again, pretend everything's independent, and, and look at how our parameter estimates uh, are. And so let me walk you through here. This would be the, uh, the true values that we simulated the data under uh, for humans, true values for flies, the dots denote the maximum likelihood estimates for the, um, for the different simulation replicates. And what you can see is we have excellent power to, or, or you know, they, they, well, the, the uh, 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 estimates cluster around the true values that we use to simulate the data, which is good. And then this is the case where the null model, where we essentially simulate with the constrained distribution. And you can see that in both cases, we, they are, in all three cases, actually, gray is the constrained model. It sort of fits exactly with the, um, uh, at, at the true value. And then the issue of, OK, how are the likelihood ratio test statistics distributed under the null? That's what's shown here. So again, when we simulate under the null model, employ our inference procedure where we test you know, the, the full model versus the constrained model, you can see this is the distribution of the likelihood ratio test statistic. This is the asymptotic chi-square distribution. And so you can see, indeed, it does have a fatter tail um, compared to the chi-square, so consistent with the idea that the asymptotics aren't formally applying here. On the other hand, while the tail is, is fatter, it's the, we don't see values nearly as extreme as what we see in the actual data, suggesting we, uh, allowing us to obtain essentially a p-value this way through this sort of non -par or through this parametric bootstrap. I believe it's either the current or the ancestral size. It, we generally pick one and, and use that consistently in, in both. But what you can see here is that, so, so right, so if you remember on the previous slide when I talked about S, it was humans had more strongly deleterious mutations. But now when we look at NS, you actually see it's the other way, where now the flies have more. In other words, NS is bigger. And so the idea is S is smaller in flies, but N is just so much bigger. And then when you look at NS, then the, it's really the n, the bigger n, that's dominating this particular pattern here. I think in a previous slide you were calling it the long-term fuzzing, so maybe there is some assumption that it stays at least in the same order of magnitude over it. Over yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of like practically, this is essentially either scaled by the ancestral or the current size, and I honestly just don't remember which. But it's, do you remember, Bernard? Ancestral. It's ancestral, OK. Yeah. 
because there's, a, there's more polymorphism in the flies than the humans. So in terms of where most of the signal and the data is coming from, it's, it's mostly dominated by the Drosophila data. Yeah, good, good question. So we can then reject the second model. Bringing up the third model predicts that the uh, ex uh, average selection coefficient would be less deleterious in the more complex uh, species. This is the mutational robustness model. And we've actually already rejected this model because we said that the average S was more deleterious in, in humans, not less. And so that leaves us with Fisher's uh, geometric model. And so let me say a few words about that. So first, what is Fisher's geometric model? It's essentially this conceptual model that was developed by, um, as you might have guessed, uh, uh, Fisher uh, in the, the early days of, of this uh, field. And it's received a lot of attention uh, since then. And there's been a lot of really elegant theoretical work done on it. Um, since then. But the basic idea is there's some optimal fitness of a population that exists. In this case, I'm showing you a two-dimensional space, but the idea is it's some multi-dimensional space. The actual population exists somewhere here, here denoted by the dot. And then mutations essentially will move the population around in this space. And mutations that bring the population closer to this optimal fitness would be beneficial. Those that bring the population away from this optimal fitness would be deleterious. And the idea is populations then move around in this space as they, as they evolve. There's a number of key parameters in, in this model, um, one of which is the complexity, which here does have a slightly more precise definition than the sort of hand wavy thing I gave you earlier, where it's essentially the complexity is the number of phenotypes uh, related to, 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 um, to selection, as well as the pleiotropy of mutation. So pleiotropy is if you have a given mutation, how many traits does, does that uh, particular mutation affect? So these are some of the key parameters. I'm sorry? The, the N and M become dimensions of spaces and, and, and subspaces. Mm, yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. So N would be 2, and M uh, would be actually 2 also in this drawing, right? Because the direction of mutation changes both the, the, the phenotype. Am I making Yes, that? I think that's right. Yes. OK, so we want to test Fisher's geometric model. It turns out it makes a number of predictions that, that we actually can test. Um, so the first is that um, more complex organisms ought to have more deleterious mutations than less complex organisms. And I've already sort of shown you that with the human and fly comparison. But we wanted to see if whether that holds more generally if we add more, more species in. And so what we did was we used the same sort of framework that I, I just told you about, but looked at data from natural, popu uh, natural population of yeast as well as mice, uh, you know, estimated demography in each of those species, and then estimated the, um, the uh, distribution of fitness effects. And what I'm showing you here are, in, for di these different species, the average selection coefficient that we estimate in orange is if we assume uh, selection coefficients are gamma distributed. In green is if we don't assume they're gamma distributed, but actually assume they're distributed following Fisher's geometric model using the, the uh, theory from this, this uh, paper by Lorenko et al. So there's actually some theory for what this distribution of fitness effects would look like under Fisher's geometric model. And so we can essentially pull that into this uh, Poisson random field framework for, for inference from the frequency spectrum. And the punchline is, is that as, as uh, species or one interpretation of species and com complexity is increasing, mutations tend to become more, more deleterious. And so maybe you, know, you, you could argue maybe flies versus humans. You know, maybe you weren't comfortable with that initially. But at least we can take like yeast versus humans. And indeed, you can see that the yeast have, on average, the mutations are less deleterious than, than in humans. Mice and humans, again, it's not clear you know, which one is necessarily more complex. But essentially, in my mind, you know, there's, in fact, we actually tested this. This isn't really a significant difference because there's more, more limited data for the mice. But the point is, is that this trend holds uh, pretty, pretty clearly where um, with different species have different average selection coefficients. And it's such that the mammals tend to have more deleterious mutations than more simpler uh, organisms. So in our view, that prediction of Fisher's geometric model is met quite well. Second prediction of Fisher's geometric model is that less uh, pleiotropic mutations ought to have a more strongly skewed distribution of fitness effects. So the, the idea here is, right, if you have mutations that are very pleiotropic, that means they affect lots of different phenotypes. And so the idea is, um, essentially, you're probably averaging over many phenotypes at determining the fitness effect of that particular mutation. And so that might decrease the variance of the distribution.
Whereas for mutations that are not very pleiotropic or less pleiotropic, what that means is, is that some of those will affect really important traits and will have a really severe effect. Others may affect things that have nothing to do with fitness. And so you'll have this bigger variance in this distribution of, of fitness effects. And it might look more, more sort of skewed uh, like this. I think the assumption we had here is that most are, and so this is, this is a little tricky here. So, so the assumption we had was that most of these mutations are going to be decreasing fitness. Um, although in principle, and as I'll show in a few minutes, Fisher's geometric model does obviously allow for beneficial uh, mutations to, to occur and you know, bring the population back up. So you're saying if all the mutations are? Well, if you, if you have uh huh. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure how that actually factors in here. That's a good that's a good question. So what we try to do to, to quantify pleiotropy is look at gene expression patterns, with the idea being that uh, we can look at how whether genes have a tissue specific pattern of expression or whether they have a more broadly expressed pattern of expression. So the idea being tissue specific genes we considered would be those that are less pleiotropic, whereas broadly expressed genes we considered to be more, more pleiotropic. So the idea is we could classify the genes based on their expression pattern and then use the same machinery to reinfer the distribution of fitness effects uh, in those different uh, gene categories. And so here I'm showing you the results of that. And let me walk you through it, because there's kind of a lot going on here. So humans, obviously flies. Then what we did was we divided, stratified by the overall expression pattern of genes, so low, medium, and high. So the idea is we wanted to get rid of overall expression level as, as a confounder. Uh, and then um, what I'm plotting here is the shape parameter of the gamma distribution, alpha. And the idea is that smaller shape parameters mean a more skewed distribution of fitness effects. And, and so the idea is then when we look at, let's maybe look down here at, in, in Drosophila, the broadly expressed genes have a larger uh, shape parameter than do the um, tissue specific ones. And what that suggests, in fact, is that the tissue specific genes or those that we think are more, or excuse me, those that we think are less pleiotropic actually have a less, or have a more skewed distribution of fitness effects. So let me, sorry, let me say that once more. T the tissue specific genes that are less pleiotropic um, tend to have um, a more skewed distribution of fitness effects, which would be consistent with the uh, prediction of um, Fisher's uh, geometric model. And lastly, the third prediction is that species with small population size ought to have more beneficial mutations. And let me explain how, how that prediction works. So the idea is small population size can result in the fixation of many slightly deleterious mutations that in the large population get more efficiently selected out. So when you have these uh, uh, weakly deleterious mutations becoming fixed, that ends up resulting in the population being further away from the, uh, from the optimal um, fitness. And that then creates the opportunity for many new beneficial mutations to arise and bring the population back to that closer to the, to the optimum. And so what we did was we actually leveraged some theory uh, uh, from Fisher's geometric model to actually estimate the proportion of beneficial mutations that we might expect to see under Fisher's geometric model. And the way that this, this actually works is the, the, the parameter here is the really long-term population size. So really deep in time, the, it's, we are estimating the population size under which this distribution of fitness effects may have evolved that would determine how far the population essentially is from the, the, um, the fitness optimum. And, and so, so the idea is that these population sizes that we estimate are not directly coming from the genetic variation data like we would typically do in population genetics, but rather they're the estimates that would give us the um, uh, amount of beneficial mutations that could be consistent with what we see in, in, the, um, in the data. 
And the key thing, I, I mean, obviously don't interpret these numbers literally, but the key thing I want to point out is that they're at least within the right sort of order of magnitude-ish to what we would expect to see for humans and, and insects. Uh, uh, so, so that suggests that these estimates are at least you know, reasonably um, on par. And an interesting thing that comes out of this is that if we then say, look at the distributions of fitness effects, it turns out that then we infer that about 15% of the new mutations new amino acid changing mutations in humans tend to be beneficial and compared to less than 1% in flies. And, and I think that's quite interesting because it's suggesting there's a lot of beneficial mutations occurring in humans. But the point I want to make is these are very, very, very weakly beneficial mutations that are essentially almost nearly neutral, but on the more beneficial part of that, of that, um, of that spectrum. So in conclusion, the naive assumption that fitness effects are, are constant across species, that doesn't um, appear, appear to hold. Um, selection coefficients on average tend to be more deleterious in more complex organisms. We find a stronger skew of the distribution of fitness effects in genes that are tissue specific or, or are less pleiotropic. And I think that's particularly interesting because it suggests that you know, gene, gene expression uh, pattern can have, has a lot to do with what distributions of fitness effects look like. Uh, and, and, and some, our results suggest that species complexity and long-term population size are really the key factors for determining what the distribution of fitness effects looks like in different species. And this isn't to say that other models like the mutational robustness model don't have attributes or can't be, that, that are, are valid and applicable in certain situations, but just that they're not capturing this large-scale uh, variation in the DFE across you know, multiple taxa uh, using data from natural populations. So it doesn't mean to, to abandon them. And in fact, some of these other models actually are sort of sub, can be sort of be included, if you will, at least in a, some way within Fisher's uh, geometric model. Um, so that's sort of the uh, conclusion for that. And I think maybe in the next five minutes, I'll just give you a quick punchline on the um, distribution of beneficial mutations across species. Uh, so, so far I told you a little bit about um, beneficial mutations that we think humans have more than, than flies based on this type of, of inference framework. But it turns out that other ways of quantifying uh, adaptive evolution actually come to the opposite conclusion where um, it's, if, again, thinking about amino acid mutations where there's this statistic called alpha that essentially quantifies the proportion of differences between species driven by positive selection. Apologies, this alpha has absolutely nothing to do with the alpha a few slides ago. Uh, yeah, but it's, but it's called alpha here. That's, I don't like this statistic, actually, so <laughs> maybe you can add that to the list of reasons why. Anyway, this statistic alpha calculated on human data, looking at human chimp differences, suggests less than essentially no human chimp differences have been driven by positive selection, where if you apply this same alpha to um, flies, you come up with an estimate of, of different Drosophila species, you come up with an estimate of about 40-50%. So it suggests a lot more differences between Drosophila species are fixed by positive selection than between mammals. And so an obvious question is why? And if you play this game, by the way, on multiple taxa, you can see this is just alpha for a variety of different species. You see that you know, it's, it's quite variable, with some species appearing to have no adaptive evolution and others having a ton. And so the question is, what could be going on? There's been a, a number of different uh, thoughts about what it is. Population size could be one of them, um, but that's sort of somewhat controversial. So I'm just going to cut through um, and say what we did was actually try to directly estimate this uh, 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 weekly beneficial part of the distribution of, of fitness effects using the same machinery that I um, just just spoke about and looking specifically at these um, fixed differences. Um, I'm just going to cut through some of these results. So this is how we can essentially extend the uh, previous framework to actually include in a proportion of beneficial mutations. That's this P plus parameter and the average uh, sl and the selection coefficient S plus of the beneficial mutation. So the idea is we want to estimate that. And let me actually just cut through to the final take home result that I think is kind of cool. Um, so what I'm showing you here is again, humans and flies. What we're doing here, so this is the selection coefficient for benefit, strongly beneficial mutations that could be contributing to divergence between the species. The y-axis is P plus, or the proportion of, new, of beneficial mutations. 
And what you can see here is even if whatever value of selection uh, coefficient you want to take, humans actually have a higher proportion of those uh, beneficial uh, mutations. And so that suggests uh, that, in fact, humans actually do have also more strongly beneficial uh, mutations than do the um, different uh, than, than do um, Drosophila um, species. And so that uh, we think is a pretty neat um, result. And it suggests that about maybe in conclusion, 1% of the amino acid changing mutations in humans are beneficial with this particular selection coefficient. And importantly, this is a stronger selection coefficient than the 15% I told you about before. So thinking about now strongly beneficial mutations, you know, we have for about 1%. Um, and um, and I think the sort of why this might be, the increased beneficial mutations in humans may be compensating for that greater burden of deleterious mutations. And so it suggests there's a lot of compensatory mutations that, that could be occurring. We're extending this, obviously, to look at other, other species now. And um, you know, exactly. Yep, that's, we're working on it. Yeah, so thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Sure. Yes. Um, do you also see, for example, uh, the skew when you do when you look at beneficial mutations? Do those tend to cluster in tissue specific versus broad uh, That's a good question. I'm not sure if we've looked at that. But yeah, that we could. It's a good question. I don't know. We could look at that. I would almost predict you'd see more beneficial mutations in the tissue specific ones, mostly because of in the broadly expressed ones, you'd be more likely to get something that would, you know, maybe you're being beneficial for one thing but breaking something else. Whereas in a tissue specific one, you have that freedom to, you know, sort of go do something. I mean, that's sort of the argument for why gene du or one argument for why gene du uh, duplicates could be maintained and evolve and that sort of thing. So. That would be my prediction. I'm not sure how much that directly follows from Fisher's geometric model, though. But that could be fun to look at. Yes? Um, hi. Uh, did you look at, did you only look at uh, mutations in genes that were mostly like exons? But I, there might be like a DSE for mutations that affect gene expression? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we focused on non synonymous mutations mostly because. Uh, well, the biggest one is they're easy to annotate, uh, or let me say, easier to annotate. Oh, there's still some subtlety with it, um, but you're absolutely right. And their non-coding parts of the genome absolutely do have some. Some parts of them have an effect on fitness, and potentially the non-coding parts of the genome could actually be more interesting because the target size is bigger. So you just have more base pairs, which could accumulate deleterious mutations. That's number one. Um, and number two, the individual effects might, on average, be weaker than for the average non-synonymous mutation. And that you know, then gets into a really fun part of the parameter space for population genesis, where the demography and selection together could have a bigger effect. So we haven't done that yet. Um, but I think given that the annotations for the non-coding parts of the genome are getting better and better with, after projects like ENCODE and that sort of thing, um, are, are making, you know, coming up with more data, we should be able to better annotate them, which then should mean we can do this kind of inference on that. And I also might say, right, like the amount of non-coding uh, and potentially functional non-coding DNA might be varying across species, and that could also be, be an important factor, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be the, the way to go. Yeah, and I, I know, like, like Adam Siepel and his group have done some work on, on this with trying to look at le leverage together the polymorphism and population genetic signatures with the functional uh, genomic uh, annotations to sort of look at the whole genome and try to make inferences about that. And so that's, there's, so there's some work is being done on that. We haven't done anything yet. All right, thank you.